Hello again, Guyana, and welcome to another edition of The Public Interest. I am Malaika Ramsey, happy to be in your company again this week, and returning as always is the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Brigadier the Honorable David Granger. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Malaika. Well, this week we focus on the need for national integration. Of course, as you know, the opposition leader would have made uh, several sentiments and statements regarding the importance of uh, cultural diversification. So this week we focus uh, a bit closer on the need for national integration. And Brigadier David Granger, the first thing I, I, I want to ask you about uh, beginning today's edition, um, you've said that there is definitely a need for, nation, for a national cultural policy to promote greater national integration. I must ask you, sir, um, should I take that statement to mean that Guyana is somewhat deficient in the area of national integration? That's no secret. I think there are some problems uh, in our national unity, as you call it, national integration. And uh, these problems have manifested themselves uh, over the years, sometimes violently, sometimes um, passively. I recall that in 1997, uh, the very month after Dr. Cherry Jagan died, a decision was taken to rename the Timeri International Airport, uh, an airport that would be named after, that was named after a whole people, the indigenous people. Uh, a decision was taken by the administration, the PPP administration, to rename it after one person. Now, that uh, was opposed by several Amerindian groups, the Amerindian People's Association, the Guyanese Organization of Indigenous People, and the, another Amerindian group called the Amerindian Movement. Um, the point is that the people did not necessarily object to the renaming of the airport, some did of course, but they objected to the fact that no consultation was held. Uh, again, we had a situation in which um, some of the uh, groups in the country, ethnic groups had uh, made representation for various holidays. As you know, the uh, Amerindians uh, were here all the time, but people came from different continents the Portuguese are essentially European, and they came on the 3rd of May in uh, 1935. The Chinese came on the 12th of January in 1853. And of course, Africans came, liberated Africans came on different occasions. And the Indians came in May, um, 19, uh, in, sorry, 1838. The point is that um, people came at different dates, but the decision was taken by resolution of the National Assembly to observe a rival day for all of the ethnic groups on one day, and that was a day which was um, associated with the arrival of the Indians alone. All I'm saying is there's no right or wrong, but there needed to be consultation. Uh, quite recently, as you know, the there was a group of African Guyanese who complained that uh, the 1823 monument uh, was being set up on the uh, close to the seawall, the Kitty Sea Wall in Georgetown, and it had nothing to do with the uh, 1823 vote. And of course, there were some protests. The point I'm making again is that we do not need to uh, ignore the feelings of people. Let us have a, a cultural policy which explains the importance of our national heritage and attempts to consult with the various groups so that whatever uh, solution is agreed on, you know, has broad based support. And it doesn't seem to be an imposition. Okay. But mm. Brigadier, some people may say that these issues um, are not necessarily important enough. Um, take, for example, you spoke about uh, the Amerindians and the renaming of the Timiri Airport. Do you honestly believe, not only that, also the 1820, issue of the 1823 monument, do you honestly believe that going ahead and making these changes without talking to the population or consulting with the population would have um, some sort of effect on these people? Well, in, in this case, of course, the Amerindians and in the, the, the case of the 1823 monument. I do believe that it would create the environment um, in which people can uh, 
learn to appreciate and respect each other's cultures. It will also prepare um, the environment for uh, launching some program of education so people understand what happened in 1823. They understand um, the, the reason for naming the airport, the Timiri International Airport, in the first place. You know, they understand the, the, um, the reason for the holidays. Uh, I can say that um, in 1967, the year after we got independence, um, the People's National Congress was uh, in government at that time, and a decision was taken to, um, based on advice, based on consultation, to introduce uh, four holidays, which we did not have before. And during the colonial period, the pre-independence period, um, two holidays for Hindus, which were the um, Pagwa, which some people call Holi, and Diwali, and two in holidays for um, the Islamic faith, which were Yuma Nabi, which we celebrated on Thursday the 24th, um, and also Eid al -Adha. There are other holy days, but the point they're making is that there was consultation, and this has been this, you know, in existence for over four to six years, so it means that those two groups, the Hindus and, and, and Muslims, were consulted and they were satisfied with the outcome because they now have holidays which they did not enjoy uh, in the pre-PNC, in the colonial period. So what they were saying is that there is a way of bringing about consensus. And in my view, the, the consultative approach is more beneficial and is less likely to cause controversy than the, the imposition of, of holidays. Would you go as holidays. far as to say that maybe the Amerindians and the Africans are being discriminated against by the policymakers? Well, discriminate is a strong word, but I would certainly say that their concerns have not been um, taken on board. The concerns have not been uh, fully accepted. and. I don't think that I've met people who are satisfied with the outcomes, although you can say the outcome is a fait accompli because the airport has been renamed. There is a, uh, an amendment to the act, or there's a separate um, airport renaming act, but um, it creates this groundswell of, of um, distrust, a groundswell of, of resistance, uh, of dissent. And I feel that these are damaging to the national psyche. They're damaging to national unity. They inhibit national unity when um, you know, people feel. For example, in a country, there's only one majority. Every other group is a minority. But when the minorities feel that the majority group or the largest group is imposing its will, it can lead to problems in other areas. You know, people keep looking now to see, well, what are they going to do with land? What are they going to do with employment? They feel that that attitude will permeate other sectors of society. So I think it's dangerous, and I think it, it actually destroys national unity in the long term. I may be asking you to pull out your crystal ball here or to read into the future, but in the event that David Granger and the op and uh, AP and you, sorry, wins the next election, whenever that may be, the next regional and general elections, do you see changing uh, the name of the airport on uh, the, 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 the list of priorities, not only the name of the airport, but other policies and things like holidays as it relates to national integration, do you see changes coming from the APN regarding those things? I do not think there's a tradition of reversing um, some types of policy decisions um, unless they are really injurious to, to the national will or the national psyche or the national interest. Um, what we could do is put in place a new system based on consultation, based on uh, you know, consensus. It would be dangerous to go reversing you know, everything that we found. In, in some cases, for example, uh, we know that uh, a street that was named Murray Street, uh, which was named after the governor who was responsible for the suppression of the 1823 revolt, was renamed Kwamina Street. Uh, Kwamina was regarded as one of the heroes of the 1823 revolt, although he didn't actually lead anything. Uh, and there was some, some objection to renaming the street, but 
I think generally it was accepted that you know we did not need to have a street named uh, Murray. But nobody is really calling for the renaming of George Stung because it's the name after an English king, or Queen Stung because it's the name after um, Queen Victoria, or Albert Tung was named after Queen Victoria's husband. So I think you can go overboard with trying to reverse uh, uh, names of places which have historical significance. And right now, uh, I don't think there's any call for the renaming of the airport, but what we can commit ourselves to is ensuring that there is no further breakdown in the system of consultation and communication with other uh, residents of the country. We want to establish what I would call a National Heritage Commission so that representatives of all of the groups could bring the ideas and recommendations from their own people, from their own groups, and these would be considered at the national level. Okay. I know uh, as part of your efforts to uh, focus on promoting this national cultural policy, your next move is to go to the National Assembly with it. Would you like to shed some light on that? Well, we have a problem in our country in which there is no youth policy, and I think the absence of a policy affects the development of youth. There is no um, sports policy. And you can see that there are controversies in cricket and football. And I would say some other sports are underdeveloped, relatively underdeveloped. And there is also no cultural policy. And I believe what I've been saying is relevant to the absence of the cultural policy. If we had such a policy, I think the approach would have been different. So in going to the National Assembly, we hope to encourage the government to set up this commission, which could prevent these collisions between the administration and various groups. We know that the administration gives out money, uh, you know, like at emancipation time or Indian arrival time, but I do not believe that that is the way to go. There's nothing wrong with giving out money, but it must be done in a more structured way, and the people of the country must uh, feel that their money is being well spent. It's public money after all. It's not the minister's money or the president's money. It's public money. And uh, we want to create ins an institution called the National Heritage Commission, and we want to create a policy called the National Cultural Policy, which will guide the behavior of the administration in this particular. It's very important. It's very important. If people are generally dissatisfied with the behavior of the administration, even in a cultural field, it will affect the performance in economic and other fields. That's my view. Okay. Let's get back to some specifics. Um, one of the things that you would have said in a statement that you would have done to promote this cause is that discrimination diminishes our humanity. A single spark of resentment can become raging inferno of hatred, which can take a generation to extinguish. Now, do you believe that such a situation exists in Guyana whereby we have uh, persons not understanding each other's culture? Do, do you believe it, it is at that dangerous uh, situation? In my assessment, most of the wars uh, since maybe the Korean War, um, so, or this, even Second World War, most of the wars that have taken place in the world and that continue to take place are, are civil wars, and many of them have to do with ethnicity. And that is why I feel that um, we need to be very careful when we're dealing with ethnic relations. And for example, the war in Sri Lanka, which came to an end um, only a couple of years ago, well, you know, had taken thousands of lives. There's a war taking place now in, in Syria. It is a war. And it's largely sectarian between various um, ethnic and maybe religious groups. And uh, there's a, a civil disturbance taking place down in Mali. But when you look at the, the conflicts which have occurred, um, at least in the second half of the uh, 20th century and in the early years of the 21st century, most of them seem to have their origins in ethnic or religious uh, differences. And even terrorism, you know, like in, in Northern Ireland, because it was really a struggle between uh, people who call themselves Protestant and people who call themselves Catholic. Both of them go to church and believe in God and um, believe in Christ, and then they, they come out and do terrible things to each other. But 
sectarianism and ethnic uh, conflict have contributed uh, to a lot of the the, uh, the damage, a lot of the loss of life over the last 60 years or so. And I do not think Guyana is at that stage. The whole purpose of the motion in the National Assembly is to prevent Guyana to get, um, from getting to that stage so that we could uh, appreciate each other's culture better and we don't have to be in confrontation all of the time. We need to understand that there are nine Armenian nations in Guyana. We need to understand how they think. Only a few days ago, um, the groups of indigenous people were picketing outside of the Ministry of Armenian Affairs because of um, a judgment of the court, which uh, was seen as an affront to the Armenian people, and it affected their land rights. So we are not at that stage. But as I said in, the, in, in my motion in the National Assembly, sometimes only a spark, maybe an insult, could trigger um, a riot or could trigger um, uh, some disturbance of the peace. I lived in Nigeria for, for some time, and I am saddened at some of the uh, massacres that have been taking place attributed to a group called the Boko Haram, which is seen to be a, a, an Islamic religious group, and um, several Christians have been massacred, mainly in the north. The north is largely Islamic, but that's just, uh, that just gives you an idea of how dangerous um, religious and ethnic differentiation could be. Um, in, in even nowadays when you, know, you expect states to be run along lines which protect human life, but lives are being lost at a, a terrible rate, an unsustainable rate. Okay. Many may believe that, um, because I've, I've heard sentiments that racism is still very high in Guyana. I mean, your thoughts on that, and do you believe that this uh, journey that you're uh, taking on, um, whereby you want a national cultural policy, do you believe that if racism is still higher, if it still exists, in Guyana, do you believe that this could help to somehow either eradicate or minimize at least the effects of racism? I do believe that. Uh, I do believe that one of the contributory factors to racism is ignorance. Uh, there are other factors. There's greed, you know, there's a desire from by one group to dominate another group and so on. But very often there's ignorance and very often there is a lack of enforcement of legislation. Um, ignorance because um, Guyana, relative to the size of the population, is quite large, and many people on the coastland don't know how the people in the hinterland live, for example. And equally, uh, you find people in the hinterland who treat everybody who comes from the coast, regardless of ethnicity, as a coastlander, as an outsider. Um, that is unhelpful. The education system must try to bring people together, you know, through history, through heritage, through cultural exhibitions, through visits and so on. Uh, racism is alive, but this measure that I am proposing now, the creation of a, a national cultural policy and the establishment of a National Heritage Commission, would diminish, would help to bring it under control by uh, embarking on programs which could help to explain the importance of uh, the practices and cultures of one group to another group. Uh, I remember as a child growing up in a large Christian community, and many people were, were um, really unaware of the you know, practices in Hinduism or Islam, mainly because under the British, you know, prayers, Islamic or, or um, Hindu prayers, were not offered at public ceremonies. But after uh, PNC went into office in 1964, that was established. You know, the celebration of their festivals. So there was no mystery anymore. People understood. And now, I think quite recently, you have a, a person who won a chutney competition who, from appearances, does not seem to be Indian, you know. But it, it means that the fusion is taking place, and the third largest ethnic group in the country now is mixed. Um, there are even more mixed people than indigenous people in Guyana. So after Indians and Africans, it's a mixed group. And many of these people share the values of the different cultures 
um, that they have inherited. For example, a person who is mixed Indian and African, you know, one parent might be, uh, one, as, you know, mother might be African, the father might be Indian, and he or she sees no problem in in, a, in respecting both parents and maybe observing practices. I know uh, an Indian person who is also Christian, but he is very happy to go to um, religious ceremonies, Hindu religious ceremonies, which part of his family would adhere to. So things have changed um, uh, in the, in the post-independence period, largely as a result of the, the open approach to culture that was taken by the um, People's National Congress government uh, in the post-independence period. And that is why I would like to feel that this measure here will accelerate that process, which seems to have slowed uh, over the last 20 years. Okay. How do you think um, this, uh, this, this new policy, once uh, put into place, because we, we're in an age where we have Brazilians coming here and, and, and they're setting up residence and these kind of th kinds of things. How do you believe that such a new policy will help Guyana to more or less integrate further with the Brazilians and get comfortable with each other? Because the fact is, not all Guyanese are currently comfortable with Brazilians, and I, I, I'm assuming that goes vice versa. So how do you believe that this will help? Well, that has not been a, a, an important concern at the present time because many uh, foreign investors are coming in, Chinese investors are coming in, uh, Brazilian investors are coming in, there are Venezuelans as well. I was once at one aerodrome in the hinterland and people were speaking French. Um, it means that people are coming in, particularly in the extractive industries, mining, timber, and so on. And uh, it happens all around the world. You know, there's a process of globalization. If Guyanese don't possess skills, um, they would, you know, need to accept expertise from other countries, sometimes capital investment. I once um, listened to a lecture by somebody connected with the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission, and the, the person explained how the Brazilians had brought important technology into the mining sector. Maybe some people might regard it as destructive, but uh, the intrusion of foreigners is not always uh, damaging to the national culture. It sometimes enriches the national culture uh, because uh, Guyana, you know, at least for the over the last uh, maybe close to around 80 years, had persons of um, Portuguese ancestry, and in, in fact, newspapers used to be published in Portuguese, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, Church, church services in the Roman Catholic Church, particularly the one in Main Street, used to be conducted in Portuguese. And several words that uh, we still use, not many now, but uh, certainly when I was growing up, the several words that were used um, uh, were of Portuguese origin. And they still use. But, uh, so Portuguese is not strange to us. Um, in my own profession, I was trained in Brazil, <laughs> and I have read a lot of, in military techniques, of course, and I have a lot of respect for the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian Army, and the Chief of Staff was trained, the present Chief of Staff was trained in Brazil, several officers were trained in Brazil. So there has always been, at least for the last um, four to five years or so, we've always had very good, very cordial relations with Brazil. So I don't feel offended by the entry of Brazilians um, into Guyana. We just hope that they'll be done in a, that entry will be done in a legal way, and if they're taking any metals out, that will be done in a legal way as well. But in the new era, in this new millennium, we need to accustom ourselves to uh, people from different uh, countries, different ethnic groups coming in to, to work, live, and intermarry in, in, in our country. That is the reality. Okay. Let's bring it back home a bit. Now, uh, our national I identity, and there are several symbols, not only symbols, but events that, um, in a sense, advertise our national identity. Now, the problem is that we don't take, for example, uh, we have our stamps. We, we don't hear much about these things. At least after we left, uh, we would have left the primary school. We don't hear much of these things unless there is an occasion. I'm, this may be getting into the work of the committee that would be set up to promote um, national integration, but 
how do you see or, or I should ask you if it is lacking the promotion of these symbols slash events are lacking how, how can we work to develop these things and make them more out there more known again we seem to have uh, changed for not necessarily for the better uh, because there was a time when Guyana produced some of the most beautiful stamps I've ever seen, you know, of the flora and fauna of Guyana. We had, you know, beautiful flowers and orchids, birds, animals. You know, you were proud to keep Guyanese stamps. You know, you, you almost felt that you were doing a disservice by actually putting it on a postage stamp. You know, they were all keepsakes. Similarly, we produced some beautiful coins, um, which were you know, um, which had uh, depictions of Guyanese animals. I think they might have been produced at the time we became a republic. Um, they're not meant to be spent in the stores, they're meant to be um, souvenirs. Uh, but they're beautiful. And I felt that there was a surge of pride in being Guyanese in that uh, post-independence period. But uh, later on I saw stamps with, you know, Donald Duck and Michael Jackson and uh, you know I said well what's going on here you know it, 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 the Marx Brothers I said you know to come from beautiful stamps with Lucanani and Pirai and, and fish and uh, fauna of our country and then to go to this it was like a caricature and I, I was personally offended by that um, and similarly, I hear there are going to be two coins. Uh, well, who decided on those two coins? Now, one coin is going to commemorate the 175th anniversary of the arrival of the Indians, and another coin is going to commemorate the 175th anniversary of the emancipation of the Africans. But, you know, a few years ago, we had the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the Chinese. Uh, and a few days ago, they celebrated the 160th anniversary. Then we had the, well, we passed the 175th anniversary of the arrival of the Portuguese um, in 2010. But these events seem to have been ignored. So what I'm asking for is equity. Um, when we produce these objects, whether they're stamps, whether they are uh, coins, commemorative coins, or whether they are monuments, yeah, we should consider, you know, what brings Guyanese people together. And I think that if you claim to have six ethnic groups or more, whatever, um, if you're going to produce coins, you know, think about the prospect of producing coins which represent everybody, um, rather than producing only two coins and ignoring four or five other groups. I'm asking these questions. I'm not, I'm not necessarily um, taking up a cudgel on behalf of one group or the other, but I said, look, if we are one nation and we're trying to have an integrated nation, we should give more consideration to all the groups. Okay, this is certainly a topic we're definitely going to have to uh, pick up on again uh, during the next edition. But finally, before we go, sir, in the final uh, 60 seconds or so of this program, we know that David Grinch is known for these wonderful exhibitions and uh, uh, past, uh, if you, you want to call them memorabilia. Can we expect anything from you, whether it be stamps, anything that would promote you know, our national integration? If there's anything that I possess or anything I could do to bring this about, I will. Mm -hmm. Because I do believe that national integration is not only embedded in the name of a partnership for national unity, but is also important for posterity. I certainly would like my children and grandchildren to be aware of the, the beauty of other ethnic groups and the beautiful country, one of the most beautiful countries in the in the Caribbean that they live in, the Republic of Guyana. Okay. Brigadier the Honorable David Granger, Opposition Leader. Thank you very much, sir. Guyana, this has been another edition of The Public Interest. I am Malaika Ramzi, inviting you to join me again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>